Justice Collaboratory's primary aim is about fundamental criminal justice reform. So we live in a world right now where criminal justice is oriented around a get tough approach that assumes that the best way to achieve its goals, assuming its goal is crime reduction, is to be ever more punitive, ever more aggressive, this assumption that people will comply with the law when they fear the consequences of failing to do so, that longer and more prison terms are better, so on and so forth. All right. Now that's a relatively new approach, actually, especially when it comes to policing, because you know, 30 years ago, no one actually believed that police made a difference at all in crime reduction. I, I, should pause and repeat that. No one thought <laughs> that police made a difference. You know, what police were for were to apprehend wrongdoers and bring them to justice. That's what they were for. And it's only been relatively recently, in the sort of early 90s, um, mid-late 90s, that we were actually able to show that deploying police in very specific targeted ways could reduce crime, that it was even a plausible idea that putting more police in particular places would be associated with crime reduction. And that's led to some benefits, lower crime, but it's also led to some incredibly great costs. A destruction of trust in communities where it's most needed, um, a highlighted um, you know, racial disparity, and not only in the context of contact with police, but also in imprisonment and um, also in um, you know, police shootings, all of that's associated. And so the collaboratory sees its work as deploying this theory, which is one of our organizing principles, to reverse these trends and try to figure out ways to come up with particular strategies, but also institutional organizations that are more effective for the stated aims that you know the institution's leaders say they care about, let's say crime reduction. It's actually a more effective way to achieve crime reduction. But our goals are loftier than that, right? Because you know, when people trust the institutions that they have a right to rely on, um, it's more democratic, it's more fair. It's really a fundamental component of citizenship. And that's really um, one of our primary goals, actually. Well, how is it that people come to the conclusion that authority ought to be obeyed, if that's what uh, we think legitimacy is? And the procedural justice research says that four factors matter. Um, one, giving people an opportunity to participate in policy formation and um, the formation of laws in an actual interaction with a legal authority like a police officer, getting to tell your side of the story. That's called voice. Second thing that really matters is the extent to which people can perceive that decisions are fair. Um, so um, with that, we look for decision maker neutrality, transparency, again in an interaction with a police officer, is the officer telling you why she stopped you or why she's doing what she's doing, right? As opposed to just saying, do it because I said so. Third, people look for what we call fair treatment. They want to be treated with dignity, respect, respect for their rights, politeness. And fourth, this last one's the most complicated um, to explain but it's easy to say. Um, we call it trust, uh, we call it <laughs> motive-based trust. So in that case, people are trying to assess the extent to which the authority that they're dealing with can be trusted to behave benevolently toward them in the future. And that's gonna be a multiplicity of a bunch of factors. Um, I actually think that last factor is a really important one right now. You know, it has a lot of historical valence and freight and the like. So those four things matter a lot. And notice none of these four things have anything to do with the extent to which um, a police officer is effective or policing agencies are doing a really good job at reducing crime or even 
the extent to which they're obeying the law, actually. Um, that's one of the really interesting things about the research. So we were really um, lucky to have this opportunity to work with Chicago, two of Chicago Police Department's best trainers, um, two uh, men named Bruce Littman and Al Fiera. Through that collaboration, we worked together to develop a full day of what we call PJ-1. It's the first day of procedural justice training for the Chicago Police Department, seven hours. It's an, it's an entire day. Um, basically introducing the basic concepts of the idea, the theory, in a way that is conducive to how police officers will learn it. So not the way I would lecture it. So that's the first day. The second day is um, applying these ideas to tactical situations. The first day of Chicago training um, has been delivered in Oakland and Stockton, um, several cities across the country. There's huge demand for it right now. And we are working with the Department of Justice's Diagnostic Center to figure out a way to efficiently roll out this training um, across the country. Wes Scogan, who's a political scientist at Northwestern, has already done the first evaluation, peer-reviewed evaluation of the first day of training and shows some pretty significant effects. Um, Tom Tyler and um, Rick Trinkner, who is a postdoc here, um, have done a second follow-up study, um, which also is quite strong. Um, the National Initiative has a team of researchers headed up by the Urban Institute to evaluate how the training is working in our six pilot studies. And the collaboratory itself has plans right now to roll out a randomized control trial, so a kind of gold standard assessment in a different set of cities.